All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We are live and we have an exciting guest for you today. We are going to be talking about headaches, jaw pain, and posture. Uh, I'm happy to introduce you, uh, someone from my personal professional growth study group, Dr. Esmali. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris, for having me. I'm excited to share some of our so many profound conversations with your audience here. So hopefully they take some pearls from it that's going to help them. Doctors, patients, parents, welcome. Excellent. So maybe you want to fill people in. You've had a, quite a journey to get to where you are here yeah. on this soil. Maybe uh, <laughs> fill them in a little bit about your journey and yeah. your path. Thanks, Chris. Um, so my journey, um, my last name spells it out, Esmaili. So I didn't know what to do with my professional line with that last name. Um, totally kidding. Became a dentist literally coincidentally. I thought I want to be a pharmacist. Well, I grew up in Iran, immigrated to the United States when I was 20 years old with the pursuit of following chemistry and being a, being a chemist and a pharmacist. And um, somebody nudged me into the direction of dental school and being a dentist. I've never met a dentist in my life. So uh, fast forward, 10 years later, I finished dental school in 2009 and I've been practicing since. So for about 15 years, I've been a dentist with a title. But four years ago, the real turning point of my career happened during the pandemic. When they're about three and a half, four years ago, and I decided dentistry doesn't make sense. I was awakened into the world of the complexity of humans and teeth. So what happened is I want to be a TMJ specialist. I want to be a more comprehensive dentist, bought a practice in Boulder, Colorado, I want to be specialized in addressing like all the you know arch and, and facial statics, cosmetics bring in specialists to my practice and I want to be a TMJ specialist because I knew that jaw joint and arches because I'm out of the one tooth dentistry. I want to be a whole arch dentist and TMJ is just all over it. And my journey started when I looked into this one jaw joint and I could never go back. The curiosity just built itself out towards leading up to pandemic. I wasn't doing general dentistry anymore because I had enough information to know general dentistry without understanding the whole body that controls the one jaw joint is impossible but I didn't know how to treat it properly. So long and the short of it is the best thing for my career, not for the world happened. The three months pause from the hamster wheel that I was in for 10 years at that point um, called practice. Practice is doing what we were told and never questioned. And I had the time to do that. And I wrote down, why am I not doing dentistry? And what do I want to be 30 years from now? And I wrote in that mission statement, I don't want to be a dentist anymore. I don't want to be doing this clinical carpentry nonsense because I can see why people have gum disease, why they break their teeth, why they have all the symptoms. And everything points to one thing, the mouth. And we can address it. Like I'm receiving all of the symptoms that something breaks in the body shows up in the mouth. I knew it because for the audience, I also have a uh, background as a personal trainer. I've, I became a personal trainer three years after I became a dentist. I have a lot of background in kinesiology, corrective exercise, posture correction, and knowing two ends of the body, the feet, ankle, hip, and then mouth. I knew that there is a correlation and I knew the mouth is falling apart because of the interconnected of the body. And then I sat down and I wrote it. Why am I doing dentistry when I don't understand the rest of the system? So you could imagine at that point, I have a full-time practice Cosmetic dentistry in one of the most desired zip codes in Colorado doesn't get better than Boulder and going 400 miles an hour. There's no way I can stop and think. And the pandemic had me shut down to do just that. And that's what I think most of us as doctors never get a chance to do, to sit down without the having to go back to pay the payrolls and the bills and this patient and that patient. You have three months think. And I utilize that time to say, do I really want to continue doing this? And where do I want to take this journey? So that mission statement was my 400 yard skid mark and a U-turn to shift my career. I just said, I'm going to heal the patient. I don't want to be a dentist the way I am now. I will come back to dentistry when it makes sense, but I am not going to make tooth enamel dust anymore. I'm not going to put, you know, crowns on teeth. I don't know why they break. I'm not going to treat periodontalities. I don't know where it's coming from, filling holes and cavities. I don't know why they have. And um, the hardest thing in my life was selling my practice during pandemic. That's the worst time equivalent of suicide and I did that <laughs> exit out of clinical dentistry and wanted to be an airway specialist so for three years three and a half almost going on four years I've been doing just that and I could not be happier with my decision I couldn't be more thrilled about that decision because I'm sitting out here Chris telling you 
this has been the best journey, helping patients, aligning their bodies and learn with them. And I'm sharing some of the pearls of that process with everyone listening here. Thanks that I didn't see when I was a dentist because my brain didn't know and I my eyes couldn't see. So if I can just bring a glimpse of that here, it's an hour well spent. So hopefully the 60 floor elevator pitch brings everyone up to speed, you know, who I am, why I'm here, why we're having this. Well, it sounds like you took the time to uh, be constructive in the time out and change change direction. And I yeah. think a lot of us get caught up in this, whether you know, you're a professional or just a family, um, you're just stuck in the fast lane because there's no time to divert. Um, and you're just doing what's normal, but that's not necessarily great for your health. I know we had talked about a little earlier before we got on live here today, you know, everything needs to be based in what the brain does and the anatomy tells us, and it's all in a book. And anyone that tells you different is crazy. And exactly. the one thing that always sticks with me when I do collaborative care with dental professionals and, you know, in chiropractic school, they teach you how the, you know, the embryo is formed and, you know, C4 starts a nodal cord and they kind of teach you from that down and then dentist starts this way. So really people, um, are shocked to find out that your spine starts in your mouth. And you know what? Really you hit the nail right start. Don't steal my spark here. Chris, this is what I like all the audience to see. And this is going to be visual as much as audio, right? We're going to have, because uh, I want everyone to see what I'm doing. So here, look at this. This is one human, one cell formed to become an origami, a human. Human me here. So in the womb, the process starts in the womb. There is embryological tissue that becomes this and that and the root map is sitting in our genes you know what activates every gene we have all of those genes that later on become dysfunction cancer cancer is a survival gene we have it it's not like oh it comes out of nowhere i used to do cancer study and salivary glands and one of the things we'll look at is what are the biomarkers that are telling the nucleus to activate the genes that are already there what are the proteins that kind of get elevated from the nucleus and the production that cause production of cancer cells how do they come into being? What triggers them? So it's not like we just have this genes poof come into our DNA. It's already there for survival. What the environment does, turning this instead of nice folds at the right place, the environment provide us what? Pressure. Like we're, we're being molded like a vase. From inside there is resistance and from outside there is pressure. So the balance of the two turns into the vase, the art that we need to become, the human, right? Without barometric pressure, there is no inspiratory flow going in to make us breathe. That There's a sin pendulum with our breathing. So we breathe in so we can breathe out. We breathe to respire. So think of breathing as a condition we need. Like we're calling disease. What is disease? Is disease, is health absence of disease? We don't, we're defining disease as if it came out of nowhere. And if we can get the symptoms to go away, right? Disease is connected to symptoms. If you can make the symptoms go away, now we're healthy. Not true. We are healthy because our subconscious is taking care of the imbalance of outside and inside of us without our awareness because we have what called adaptive capacity. We are able to, within our range of adaptive capacity, homeostasis, able to meet the demand of the environment. And if the environment is not perfect, we can meet it somewhere in the middle, spend a little bit more of our adaptive capacity in form of our ligament lacks a little bit, shift the body a little bit, whatever our bones can take, our nerves can take, breathe dysfunctionally, right? To the point where we get to the edge of that. And when we are at the edge of that adaptive capacity, it's like, think of your bank account. Your adaptive capacity is how much money you have in the bank. Now, if you were born with good adaptive capacity, good genetic, and you have access to good nutrition, your ligaments and bones and nerves can take much. And your mental capacity, you were born in a good two parents family, good culture, you didn't grow up in war like I did. Your environment emotionally was giving you good adaptive capacity mentally and biochemistry and physically. So if you know, world puts pressure on you, yeah, can you can spend a little bit of that, right? And you can meet the demand and you never know. It's not like you're healthy, you're still adapting. But then think about someone who had been handed over the worst set of cards as far as their genetic. They can methylate. They have issues with their gene adaptability and they they didn't have the right nutrition to support them for what their genes are lacking to convert. That's just genetic, right? And their cranial structure was just twisted at birth. They were suction delivered and their genetic also was predisposed to lack of facial development and they were mouth breathing and then one that to another. So you see how that person is spending 
way more out of that adaptive capacity bank. Well, they had, they were born with like a few dollars in their bank and then they spend, they're overdrafted. They are sick from minute one. Those are kids that are in NICU. We see them and they're just always in the care of a physical therapist from get, this doesn't have to be that bad. These people do not have a capacity. So what's the difference between the first and the second? Adaptive capacity. It's not like one is sick and one is healthy. One has adaptive capacity and one doesn't. And the world come in, there's more pressure from outside and they have nothing from inside to meet. So when the pressure from outside, the barometric pressure, the resistance, the gravity, the environment, the psychology of where we are, where we, where we grow up, what continent we were born in, right? All of that comes in and clumber this into this, right? This is not an origami, okay? I was not, or when we see a child, it is not origami. Okay, what do we do with that? We get the symptoms. Oh, your child cannot cannot stand up. Hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and give him three years worth of physical therapy to get them to move this finger that way. Uh, we don't know how they got here. We don't know that they have a reflex in their neck that was never dropped. That manual break was never released. We're just gonna put them in a fourth gear. We don't know neutral. Here we go. Oh, I see that child at age seven. Ooh, cool. Let's just give him some braces, shall we? Give him a palate expander. Okay. Is this still what it's supposed to be? No, because what right now is lacking from all of medicine and dentistry, physical medicine, functional medicine, dentistry, all of us orthopedists, all of us functional medicines, all of us psychologists. We're looking at people from tiny little lens. We're seeing one part of this clumbered system because we're symptom driven and symptoms only come when your adaptive capacity is met. But if we doing what we're doing here, because imagine if we can just do what we're doing with all the other people that are treating symptoms of this clumper mess, we can only work and say, how did it get here? Okay. Chris, can you hold this while I hold this? Okay. We need a psychologist. Maybe there's more of that than this. And most people like me that grew up in, in the midst of war, I mean, first seven years of my, my life, I grew up in the midst of, you know, war and war ravaged country and revolution and, you know, that thing that would affect what my body can like do and unresolved childhood trauma and not being, not, not even knowing where it's coming from. How do we get to this point where now we can have a chance to make this do what it was meant to be a functioning human that knows how to put enough resistance against the world to be human. We need barometric pressure. We need challenge from environment. We need communities, right? We need communities of people around us to, to, to define who we are, but it's only when the community and the surrounding is putting more damage on humans in terms of who we become, that now we're getting more converged. The environment turn us into this instead of diverge and expand. We're not expanding, and that it comes into all three pillars that you and I know, chemical, mental, physical. It's not one, it's all three. And we're not even looking at the physical, spiritual aspect enough to know about. We we'll just dismiss it. But if I tell you how much of that is just as much governing and is already there, it's an understatement. But we're not going to get into that today. It's that kind of warm, I can't open. But we're just going to focus on the orthopedics and the atlas. Uh, you're, you're doing great. You know, I think. For all you spine gurus out there, people that are interested, or posture gurus out there, what you need to understand, and we'll get into this later too, is that you know, posture is your mouth and your feet. And what Bahar uh, was talking about, you know, we have to breathe to survive. And I will guarantee you that nobody ever died on an inhale, but people are suffering on the inability to inhale. You know, we expire, that's how you die. But if you can't inhale, you are dying because you're not getting enough air in. It's really yeah, interesting true. you mentioned that, Chris. Like literally last night, I was reading this article about the new insight. This is a 2018, for those nerds out there, 2018 study that the new insight and timing of potential mechanism of respiratory induced cortical arousal in sleep apnea. It's a huge thing right now, right? Well, I read this article and I read it at two in the morning. So how much I'm retaining, um, bear with me. It's saying that they did a study and they say, well, we're thinking that people that snore and have breathing problems, they collapse at the end of their inspiratory flow. Meaning think of our airway on our neck as the tube that we get the air in and out. So patency of that tube depends on, remember, what's outside and what's inside. That balance determines every aspect of our being and our airway. Yes, it's the most important reflex. The airway and the patency of it determines how we get the air in and how we get the air out. And that process determined by our physiology, by our anatomy, what barometric pressure we live in, a lot of things. And so that balance, you see how that quantum that is involved with what's inside and from what outside. And 
is determining how the air, air gets in and out. So up until now, the medical community decided that the arousal, that are depending on the inspiratory pressure, happens at the end of the inspiratory, uh, inspiratory negative pressure, the intrathoracic pressure. Let me explain what that means. So think about our area as a tube, and there's an, one, two ends to it. So if you're flowing air in between the two, okay, one direction, that's inhalation, at the speed at which that travels and and um, the the speed is one thing, but also how this air is being handled with just two ends is important to keep it keep it open. So if we fast the kind of pulling the air in, it collapses that in the middle. That's collapsible airway. Now, why would we have more faster flow of the air going in? Right. That's all that anatomy and how the the whole thing is held together because think of the airway as the tent those tents we put up so if the tent is only half they open like this which most humans are birth trauma half they open the bones in the head are crooked so the soft tissue that's hanging off of it, the palate the airway muscles the pharyngeal areas are all just not fully taut because the whole bones that hold them are not right so what happens is and what we're breathing, there's more resistance here in the nose and the cranium. And then the diaphragm is just really trying to get the air through. So it goes faster and makes it go collapse, right? Inhalation. So they thought the arousal happens at the end of the inspiration. And this study says, you know what? That theory is disproven because most of this happened in exhalation. What now? Like all of our theories are now need to be re-explained because we're saying we fail to exhale properly. We get closure of the nasal aperture, failure of the diaphragm to do what it's supposed to do because the interthoracic pressure is dependent on posture. We didn't understand the quantums of this. And we'll never do because we're part of this. is One of the physicists, I, my favorite quote is, we're trying to solve a puzzle where we're a part of it. We're eating Oreo cookies and brushing our teeth at the same time. As a dentist. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I also think of it like this, you know, when we talk about it in cranial dynamics, you know, when you inhale, you flex and you exhale, you extend, but as you extend, it narrows out. And like, if the structures are only this big, think about that too, collapsing, you know, and then if people have either inflammation in the nose or deviated septum, which we'll get into the maxilla later, or, you know, their mouth breathing, it's pushing the air in too fast, right? The, the whole, the, it's Bernoulli. That's the Bernoulli effect. Like, for, like a visual for people is like when you're in the shower. So imagine the shower head is right, right next to you. If the pressure of the air coming in is faster, it gets the shower to the shower curtain to stick to you, right? So if you only have a curve with that shower curtain and slow down the pressure, there's distance between you and the shower curtain, right? That's whole pressure and speed. So why would people? inhale faster well mouth breathing is one but also bypassing that collapse and trying to keep this airway taut and open and uh you you, you nailed it in the head chris because you talked about what's in the head and this is a concept that i i don't know what your audience are, are, are patients or doctors and for that matter if you're a dentist and listening to this they don't know the things you know so i'm going to speak this in a language that even for doctors we could understand each other better everyone needs to hear this from everybody these, needs to hear it so uh, this little crystal ball, <laughs> I call this the crystal ball, a human skull. Whoopsie. I love this because it just shows you how, how movable and fragile the sutures are. So human, human skull has to pass through what's called a birth canal. So like a telescope, it has to come together and goes through birth canal. So there are reflexes that are geared to kids right before birth as their head gets descended and just get upside down towards the pelvic floor. And they're ready for birth process. During the last few weeks of uh, gestation, they're ready, gearing up for that. Now, what happens in our modern delivery room? Moms are in hospital beds with the sacrum is not positioned properly. So moms are not in a squat position. So the kid's head gets against the, the sacrum in, in, in horrendous ways. I mean, moms are not moving around. Amniotic fluid just keeps the kids in more of a more reflex fear paralysis. They're not moving around in the womb. And I thought it's just only going to happen when they are born, when they have iPads in their hands. Seems like that's all happening in the womb. Hear me here. Uh, when they are ready for the birth process, what happens? They go to the hospital, elective cesarean or whatever, bridged, 
and the, and the mom gets epidural more often than not. So the, the, the kid is going through a labor process. If it's not induced by Pitocin, it's a whole nother thing. The kid is going through a label without mom because the whole contraction process, mom and baby going through that process together allows the cranium, the reflex set to do what they were supposed to do, get the kid through. Because we go from being an amphibian in the womb, we don't breathe, we respire. We get our oxygen through mom. We have Our lungs are filled with amniotic fluid. When we're born, the first breath is going to turn us from amphibian to humans with lungs. So that first breath goes, this thing, the tent opens, supposedly. If things were correct, the whole thing goes into motion. It opens the whole thing to open and collapse or open and extend. So that motion of the head, the cranial bones in the head moving, especially around the side of the face as we breathe in, as Dr. Chris was saying, when we're breathing, the pressure inside of us increase and sacral bulb, which is bottom of the spine, you know, the, the, the triangle bone at the bottom of the spine moves and pushes the CSF fluid up towards the skull. And the skull is a smooth. And then as we exhale, it gets squashed. And then the pressure kind of descends it down. That process, our head and our tail kind of doing this swing, this pendulum, needs to happen with full motion of the skull and the pelvis. But what happens that disrupts that process? The birth process. So the first breath does not get that full motion. This part of the occiput, back of the head gets jammed against the skull. I mean, that's most kids left occiput comes first and just kind of go through the birth canal. Suction delivery to just put the suction right behind, by, by the side of the skull and just squish it. Forcep deliveries, long labor delivery. The kid is not going through a labor, re dropping those reflexes. Why ep epidural, pitocin induced. Like I said, the birth labor process being so unnatural doesn't allow the kid to drop those reflexes. You're more familiar with it than I am, symmetric tonic reflexes. Ace, where do we have those reflexes geared? Because we're not fully developed humans. We're operating out of our brainstem. And that brainstem gets us through the first year as we become more sophisticated human. Now, the first thing that we have as a part of our sensory survival, besides our vagal nerve and facial nerve, why do we need the facial nerve? Sucking so and swallowing the milk for survival and trigeminal nerve, right? The tongue, the tongue needs to go through the roof of the mouth, suck the milk out, grow the face. Just that kid is going through the first phase for the next phase that needs to come. The first domino effect is already there. They went through birth canal. They are not able, besides the fact that through that process, those four lobes of the occiput, which for those who don't know what that is, is right here. This bone at the base of the skull, where our skull meets our first vertebra, this is the, and this is Dr. Chris's specialties, is the, right there. So this first vertebra is where our head sits. This is not meant for this, the skull so is a little too big. It sits here. So the position of the four lobes of this at birth, when they get jammed, some of the nerve conduits that are passing right here is hypoglossal nerve, the nerve that controls our tongue. So if the skull gets jammed and doesn't get immediately unjammed, that nerve gets paralyzed. That, that process would disable the child from properly swallowing, besides the fact that they have tongue tightness. And we don't even know the mechanism of why we have so many kids with tongue tightness. Swallowing is dysfunctional. Breathing is dysfunctional. Besides the fact that they haven't had that full uh, respiratory motion between the skull bones. So they are dysfunctionally leaking and breathing. They're not breathing. Now think about the human skull. This is my analogy, Chris. Human skull, like one of those body balls you order through Amazon, right? When it gets here, it's not fully open. What do we do? It comes with a pump. We put the pump and attach it to a little nozzle and they go down, right? So imagine either the pump is broken or the seal where it meets the ball is broken or parts of the ball that was folded got melted through the process of shipping and one part of the ball doesn't completely inflate. You inflate it. It's like, oh, it's supposed to be a round little thing that can I can lay on it that can, that can sustain my weight. Now imagine as we are breathing, our chest, our face, our pelvis is supposed to meet the barometric pressure outside. And what helps us do that is what we're creating inside the diaphragm. And the pump is leaking. The mouth that I just explained is leaking. The tongue doesn't go to the roof of the mouth. They're not able to suck properly to seal. So the child is not able to put the tongue on the roof, breathe nasally. That mechanism of that pump working is leaking. You keep pumping, but nothing is not efficiently happening. Besides the fact that when the skull bones don't move all the way through that inhalation, exhalation, um, the brain is not going to, it's not accepting what the pressure of diaphragm can do to allow this full motion to happen. Meaning 
if your diaphragm, let's say you have no problem breathing all the way down to your diaphragm, but if the skull bones are jammed and never got unjammed, early fusion of the sutures or just twisted skull during the birth process, that, I'm just giving some examples. So not just definitive, they're not mutually explicit. They, they, they're just some of the reasons why, but they're not at rest. Then the skull, the brain will limit the movement of the diaphragm because the pressure has to be between the two. What the but the skull can be what you're the, describing asthma. symptomology is asthma. Basically, it's a nervous asthma. Disorder. You just exactly that's where I was it's going backwards because it can't handle any more intracranial pressure. Exactly. So instead of dilating your lungs, constricting them, making you wheeze, so you stop doing it. Because like when you exactly you know, you look at the skull here earlier, where those three of the biggest cranial nerves come through the jugular foramen, nine, ten, and eleven. You know, vagus nerve, spinal accessory, and hypoglossal. And that's also where, you know, your carotids are. And also the CFF, you know, you talked about coming up from the sacrum, but it has to go out and go through the lymph and get recirculated. So this is these where- are obligatory mouth breathers, not because, I mean, yes, I, I mean, we acknowledge that a part of this cranium being twisted will affect the movement, which is why I took my skull apart. Whoopsie. Uh, my skull apart because when we see deviated septum that is a part of this nasal aperture so we're acknowledging they have a narrow cranium but because this i call this warehouse the motherboard this is your storefront your storefront can only represent your motherboard right and when we're seeing those but we call it that just a narrow face let's go ahead and open up the nose or shave off this the the septum or just expand the palate what about the reason why they're narrow and crooked well, it's more important to know that and address that. And when we're looking at the skull sitting on top of this, now they have to stand up at age five against gravity. Or what did I say five? I said, when we get them at age about one, they have to stand up. And those reflexes they had, you just referenced, you know, exhalation. If they have not dropped or integrated, drop is not the right forward reflexes. We integrate them into the parachute ref- reflex. The kids have it, mouth and hand coordination. They should not be retaining those. And as they go into midbrain, cerebellum comes in. I know my left, I know my right. They roll over. Oh, there you go. Cool thing. I have a right side too. They start crawling like commando and going from a exhalation, extension lesion to extension reflex to flexion. Now they can just crawl or descend or do movements with their hands. They're becoming more sophisticated. And for everyone, drop what you're doing and listen to me very intently. What happens in that process of us going from our reflexes? Now, it starts with the tongue, and tongue doesn't have boundaries. It's one of the most important structures in our, in our, in our oral cavity is the tongue. Five nerves, one muscle. Huge, important, and I will get to it. Why? But when the kids start to crawl, and they start to stand up and then know how to orient themselves. Chris, this is your quiz. What happened in that t- stage? When the kids start at six months old, start crawling and, and balancing their head. What happens in that milestone? Well, they start developing their cervical curve. And just- that's that's a chiropractic. What about their mouth? What happens in the mouth? Uh, just the, 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 the maxillary formation. Well, they get they start getting teeth. Yeah. The front, front two teeth. And do you think that's by coincidence? I mean, you just referenced the cervical, and, and I absolutely agree. The teeth come in. And kids that are developmentally delayed, their teeth development is also delayed. Do you think, think it's about going... teeth too? Like teeth yeah. are the, the teeth are really nerves. They're not bones. They're oh, nerves. this is what I was getting with. They're a nerve. Exactly why I think as a dentist, I was doing nonsense work without knowing. They didn't teach me. This pearly whites are the vertebras in the mouth. They right. are the sutures in the mouth. They have proprioception wired to them, to the ligaments that attach the tooth to the bone. Those little receptors are exact same receptors you have in your joints, you have in your knees, you have them in your shoulder, and there's ton more attached to the teeth than your joints. All right, do I have everyone's attention? That means when the teeth come in and they touch, the proprioception tells the brain where the head is. And without teeth and without that proprioception, we are not able to carry ourselves through space. That's how humans become human because teeth come in and start signaling the brain and keep telling the brain how to turn the head and how to stand up upright. And when we get molars, we start walking, right? At age about two, the molars coming down, the kids become more sophisticated with their walking. And the reflexes keep getting integrated as the mouth forms. This is the moment that I said, everyone just listen up. Teeth 
are part of our neurological development. Mouth is a neurosensory signaling that is embedded so the teeth come in and then we start integrating reflexes, becoming more sophisticated with our motor motions and movements. And every tooth has a part to play in our every development, in our orientations, in our balance, in our walking, in being in three dimension. Now, I, I really got to start seeing that the teeth, the importance of teeth is obviously at this point starting to settle. But also some cool fact I want to put out there. Same embryological tissue you mentioned in the womb, what we have formed. Same embryological tissue that forms our endocrine system that coordinates our you know, chemical adaptation to the environment and our autonomic nervous system that controls minute by minute, second by second of what we do is the same tissue that forms our teeth and periodontal ligament. The same. Mesenchymal tissues form all of them. That means teeth are in fact part of the teriology of endocrine and autoimmune, uh, or sorry, immune system, or sorry, um, uh, our autonomic nervous system. So teeth come in to develop us into more adaptive humans, which means malocclusion equates maladaptation, decreased adaptive capacity. That's how I see malocclusion. And occlusion in the mouth starts right here, how this first bone relates to the skull. And there goes my skull. <laughs> I'm notorious for that. This guy is just stunned. But it's good because we're going to talk about sphenoid next. What I'm trying to really settle here for my audience here, if they're listening intently, we are not arriving at symptoms just overnight. It's not like you got a frozen shoulder and you got a locked jaw just last night. I'm more interested in how, how you get there more than I'm interested in fixing it today because you did not arrive there one day. Why do we expect to fix it by one adjustment or an appliance or a crown? They did not get there overnight. It's a process. And that's the basis of what you and I believe to be holistic, seeing the person as a whole. It's not some cuckoo crack and some snake oil, get this vitamins and it's going to help you. It's about what your body has been doing, what adaptive capacity has been spending in lack of what to reverse engineer. And as much as I like to be the expert in the spine, I will never be. And as much as you will not know about the mouth, you will never be. But it only when we are coming together and just exchanging information in podcasts like this or what I do with my chiropractor in this clinic, we have patients coming from all over the country to come see us. Because when dentists and chiropractors, when medical doctors and dentists work together, they co-discover the patient and the patient tells them where to go with that information. We help them heal their own bodies. And you know, you and I share this common belief that body is capable of healing. Um, that's not why, why repair is so important. And you know, there's so much butchery going out there. People are like, Oh, it's your adenoids or your shoulder. And like you said, it's like, they didn't just show up with that. So why would you just start with that and then call it a day? Because I think the whole system is off. And we, as practitioners, only if we can sit down and speak anatomy and neurology and see how they arrived at that, can we get the best course of care with the best outcome with the least invasive procedures? That exactly less least amount of intervention with the most amount of outcome. And uh, I, I do believe that everything we do, Chris, even if it's a simple adjustment or a sing, single, even a sealant on a tooth will change the dynamic of the system, whether we know it or not. The reason why we don't get to hear from every patient that, oh, that didn't work is because they have adaptive capacity. They have more money in the bank. So we took a few dollars out and they're not going to feel it. But if that same patient had $100 in the bank, you drafted 20 bucks, they will know. That's the only difference in our treatments, whether it works or not, is what the patients can adapt. It's not like one felt and the other one didn't. One had more adaptive capacity. And that's adaptive capacity they need for years to come to continue meet the resistance of the world and for adapt. Like all these chronic conditions, right? We're, 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 our autonomic nervous system was meant to keep us in terms of adaptation to the environment. So um, most people think, oh, it's either one or the other. If the sympathetic is on, the parasympathetic is off. It's not that we have to have it one on and one off. We need to have full access to our autonomic nervous system because in case there is danger, truly, we need to be able to activate the sympathetic and run for life. I hope everyone can do that. If there's a shooter in your house, if you're not able to activate your sympathetic, you'll never run for your life. With the same token, those are people that are stuck in a parasympathetic. It doesn't get enough attention that there's some people that are not able to get out of the parasympathetic and they get into this. They're not balanced. The whole goal is to be balanced in the middle, but we want to be indigestive, like our uh, primitive, primitive brain knows. We are, in fact, mammals. So think of an animal. 
you know, a deer is just with his buddies, just grazing and then parasympathetic, rest, digest, doing all this stuff. They hear predator come. Noises, environment tells them that I hear something, I'm spotting something, all that information go to the brain and says run. The sympathetic gets turned on and then the deer start running and being chased by the tiger or whatever animal is. And if they get caught, if they, if they, if they flee and they get to safety, the parasympathetic, the sympathetic should be turned off and they go back to grazing. Right? They don't have no memory of that tiger chasing them. They're not going to sit down and brew on it and say, oh my gosh, I was being chased by... No, they go back to grazing. But what if they get caught? They go into what's called, not fight or flight, because you can't have what it takes to be in fight or flight with our heart rates through the roof and huffing and puffing. Our muscles just get a peripheral vascularity, just completely shot and everything going to the heart and big muscles. We can't stay in that zone. We only stay there till either we go to rest or digest or get caught. When we get caught, now we go into freeze or fawn, the dorsal vagal. That's the polyvagal theory for those people who know it. And in that zone, we're not safe to go back to grazing, but we're not in sympathetic. We're in what's called peripheral numbness, right? Why? Because if you're being eaten by that tiger now, your body will numb you so you don't feel it. That zone is what we'll find most of our patients in freeze or fawn, the state of blah. They're not exactly in parasympathetic. They're not exactly functioning. They've been, they cannot be way too long in the sympathetic that was never turned off. Our emotions, when it just for one nanosecond, touch up on the spirituality, mental, spiritual aspect of our, you know, the triangle of our health. When we are suffering from what we suffered when we were children, childhood trauma the environment has a lot to do with it where we grew up the country we grew up the environment around us how we were raised as children the safety is being encoded in us so if you don't have that safety because we encountered something before we had a frontal cortex our body just got frozen in time in that moment the effect of that freeze or fawn physiologically is going to carry through so a lot of people we see that they have um, manual brakes that are still on. My question is, how much of that is still keeping them in the dorsal vagal function? Because we can work on their neck and mouth and align them orthopedically. We can run hundreds of lab work and getting their microbiome set, working on their HPA axis. But my question remains, did we release the manual brake? Are we still dealing with those somat psychic over soma that nobody acknowledges? Or most people don't know that it is there. And that's unfortunately the state of the allopathic system that only sees us as mechanical being going through life and we're a bunch of flesh and bones and, you know, biochemistry and microbiome. And that, that's pretty much the extent of it. Even, even in holistic health, that's the extent of it. But in reality, our brain decides breath to breath. Do we have the right posture to breathe? Clearance of the airway, just for breathing. Do we respire? Do we have the mechanism, the enzymes, the mitochondria, the delivery, the, the CO2, the pH, the hemoglobin, all that mechanism for getting the oxygen to the tissue and also the primary respiration, the mechanism you and I explained, movement of the CSF fluid. And when it gets to the tissue and gets all used and uh, is available, is our brain conceiving us being in the state to breathe and respire properly? Example of that is if you're feeling anxious, without having any chemical issues or perhaps a change in your anatomy of breathing, your breathing rate changes. Your shallow breathe, your, fat, you know, your brain controls the amygdala, the hippocampus, the whole limbic system also controls the breathing rate. So if it's that important, at what point are we going to start asking a question that why are people breathing the way they do? Why is the head where it is in that forward head posture? A lot of psychologists define it the position of depression. You as a chiropractor call it malalignment of the cervical spine. With an airway dentist, I might assume that's just a tiny airway and a mouth that never developed and a tongue that's occluding them. We are all correct in our own, in our field, right? But what is that patient's really telling us and how do we understand how this happened? So. Yeah, I think along those lines, like, based on someone's adaptive capacity, we can increase that, but the problem resides is getting them to consistently stay there. And Nothing. that's where the uh, occlusion comes in, the way the mouth is closing, a closed pack system. And then, you know, you and I talked earlier, maybe you could open this window up is when the uh, importance of the maxilla and the vomer to the cribriform plate to the mm -hmm. sphenoid bone and how all this drives everything home for people. And I, just a side note, like I was floored the other day, you know, they talk about in chiropractic neurology about, you know, retain primitive reflexes and you'll see all these things in the body or whatever. And I had sent someone to uh, some like-minded for us for some chirodontics work and they came back with a reverse swallow. And I was like, so you mean to tell me that you can still have a retained primitive reflex into your intracranial nerves 
just like you would into your actual spine nerves, which is a lot. I think what we're seeing with people's dysregulation and inability to auto-regulate as well, which is absolutely. Crazy. And you know, you said it, Chris. You said uh, they're still having reverse swallow, and reverse swallow for those that are not expert in knowing is when we're swallowing, our tongue shouldn't touch the teeth. The tongue should be resting at the roof of the mouth. That's the proper. Um, and then back of the tongue should be at the back of the palate. And there's neurological spots in the mouth that orients through the five nerves attached to the tongue to control our airway for patency checking. It's almost like a check. Swallowing is a check for the brain to know, is everything good? Minute by minute. Um, it's like, set it, forget it. So when you're swallowing, our tongue going to the roof of the mouth tells the brain everything is good or not good. So when the tongue is touching the teeth, the tongue more often than not is trying to stabilize because when we swallow is the only time that the teeth upper and lower come to contact, but now in a second, those PDL ligaments I was just talking about will communicate that information, PDL periodontal ligaments, communicate that information to our brain for stability and are we still oriented correctly? So when we, when we come together and part of the mouth touch and the other part doesn't enter open, right? the brain goes, wait a minute, where's that information coming from? So the tongue kind of slips in to fill that information, tongue thrust, so tongue going in there to create that seal and stabilize the mandible against home, if there's home, and, and making that happen. And imagine what's happening inside the brain. When that flawed information gets to the brain, the brain, inside the brain is like, why? Every time you swallow, why? Sympathetic turn on. There's something wrong. That information is not right. You know what I'm saying? Every swallow can make or break you. And the, the, when we're talking about inf how is this even come to being, not a multitude of reasons for having anterior open bind and you know, thrusting. But when we're talking about reflexes, that is not getting enough attention right now is it's not as much inf it's not as much reverse swallow or tongue thrust as the correct term is it's infantile swallow. Now bear with me for a second. I want to get a little bit nerdy here because when we don't we are born, we don't have teeth right? How does the upper and lower jaw know where to be? The tongue, the tongue with all of its nerves has a place to go. And it tells the brain, which is why breastfeeding is an in reinforcement on that to just activate and let the tongue be at where it needs to be. Tell the brain where we are. That's why the kids cannot hold their neck in the beginning, you know, and they're not able to, I don't know if you, you work with babies, but it, or if you had babies, holding the neck is a milestone. They need to be held. When they're able to do that, that is telling that the tongue is doing or not doing its job properly. So when they're going to not roll over, they need to have that reflex integrated, asymmetric tonic reflex. I've seen my assistant's baby. I took a picture of her with her asymmetric tonic reflex. I'm like, when she integrate that, now she's ready to roll over because then her brain knows left and right. And tongue's a huge part of it. So imagine if tongue consistently, either as I explained earlier before my skull broke, this bone, the hypoglossal nerve, gets jammed or that they are tongue tied, literally the lack of apoptosis that the tongue did not separate. So it's physically restricted. Not all the time, the tongue tightness is not the reason for infantile swallow. It's There's more quantum into it. Tongue is one amazing muscle that is basically gonna make or break your health. If, you're, if tongue is not functioning, if the oral environment is not set properly and the tongue is not functioning and sitting in the background, the tongue becomes neck and everything goes downhill from there. And you're right, the occlusion suffers because you know, either the tongue is separating them in the name of stability that's not there, or it's just trying to achieve the seal that's cranially missing, or perhaps the reflexes hasn't, which one is it? But the problem is they all have similar presentation. And if you're just looking, if my functional therapist looks at them and say, well, it's just because of the way they swallow, let's train them to get a suction and then send them to a surgeon and snip that. Okay, there's no connection between the hardware and the software. Still that manual break is not released. I keep going back to that analogy because it's that important when the nerves are not connected to the center that controls the movement of the muscle. I think it's a great analogy too, because there's a lot of missteps in the syntax of care. You know, the study group we're with, with Dr. Walker and syntax of care, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing this work, but they're at like levels seven, eight, nine, and 10. And, you know, the, trunk, like, the tongue, like you said, is proprioceptive, but if the maxillary formation is off, you're training the tongue to the wrong position. Like you were a personal trainer. Like, yep. What would happen if your hips are misaligned, you try to squat, eventually you're gonna hit tissue threshold and the tissue is going to break down. So why would we wait until <laughs> the tongue to be trained in the tongue? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. If I would, when I was a personal trainer, that's why I got me into corrective exercise. I would do squat assessment. And if their body was shifting to one side, I would deactivate the inner thighs and activate the glutes. So they can go straight. If their knees are ducking in or they're going forward, the lumbar extension, I wouldn't put them under a squat rack because all I'm doing is exacerbating that wrong anatomy. You, you, you put them under 500 pounds, you're basically getting them closer to breakdown because on their own, they can limp along with that for another 10 years. You put them under a squat rack, you shorten that to one, which is why you, when I was, I was also a bodybuilder and I see a lot of people in the gym trying to just build that physique with dysfunctions. Like your body is not going to train that muscle you want to. The more you train the shoulders, you get upper cervical, upper neck and traps to just continue getting trained in the shoulders and they get injury and they're out of the game. And it's just so sad to see that even in our sport, we're not understanding and acknowledging the importance of aligning the body first before we put it through performance. You know, when a car is rat like, I, I mean, look at, the, look at this, something simple like, you know, a, a race car. You know, would they put a race car on a track if there's a rattle, some noise in the system? They won't. They maintain that thing like no other. So we as humans go from first gear to fourth gear without ever releasing manual brakes and never being to neutral. What, what you and I are talking about here, Chris, constantly, and, you know, Dr. Bob Walker, Cranio Dutton is huge on this, is cranial neutrality. And so are a lot of other camps in physical therapy. PRI is huge on it, is neutrality. Where is neutrality? We're talking about the pendulum, right? We breathe in a pendulum. We breathe in so we can breathe out. So if you think about respiration as a result to, or as a cure for breathing, so I'm going to use this terminology, not in the context we know. Hunger is a disease. Digestion and absorption of nutrients is the cure. So without being hungry, we won't eat. So we won't absorb the nutrients to grow. For us, if we didn't breathe in, we didn't breathe out. If we didn't have the barometric pressure coming in, in us, we won't have that to put out so we can form our chest our facial environment and then to be humans and respire and charge our electricity. All the good stuff happens in mitochondria. So from start to finish, we need one to have the other. We have, you know, we have balance here. There's a teeter-totter, right? Um, if we don't have one, we won't have the other one. It's when the balance is shot on one side and we don't recognize it and we want to create homeostasis when none exist. When we're finding people on a balanced board trying to hold on to their life, they're not balanced with their feet and everything. Just they can they can sustain a human that's out of order so much at the edge of the comfort zone in homeostasis, they'll look like they're functioning going through life, right? They come to you and me and say, oh, I'm feeling fine. You're not feeling fine. Your body has found a way to mask and adapt. You are maladapting and you're breaking down. And some people have a greater rate of breaking down physically, mentally, emotionally. And when you're enduring so much malalignment and overuse of neurotransmitters depleted in forms of their minerals, right? Because it, all it takes currency. When you're using your credit card to pay for you know, your, your bills and you crank up, you're not only paying for that, but you're only paying for the interest. Now imagine if you only had cash to spend. That's homeostasis. You don't pay interest. But when you're in maladapted, you're paying so much neurological interest. Now the neuro, no, the minerals you so badly need to function are being overspent to do the job of a system that's not functioning properly. You know. Think about it. Like you mentioned cancer before. The body's pretty smart. It's going to take these toxic things and wall it off and put a little ball to protect it from the rest of the organs. And now we see it with airway patency where there's this big thing to take out tonsils, adenoids, put in ear tubes, but that's just, and they're getting too much unfiltered air because they can't breathe through their nose. So the body's response is to create inflammation. But if you don't have infection, you have to like, what? well, why are we mouth breathing in the first place? And then even if you do do any kind of um, removal of these organs, 70% or so, some of the literature I've read is saying there's a relapse because they're still not taught how to properly nasal breathe in the first place. So why wouldn't you like look at why you're not breathing right, correct that, and then see, deal with the soft tissue inflammation and see what you're left with. Yeah. Actually, another article I want to reference here, um, a sleep physician who was really curious about the work I do, <laughs> uh, very pronounced Dr. Uh, Raj from the doctor's show. He told me to go look this up. And I encourage the audience to look it up as well, especially if they're doctors. The New England Journal in 2013 published a paper saying, admitting, fully admitting that we've been removing tonsils and adenoids in terms of improving the airway. Now we've done a follow-up study, a cohort 
double blind, just the way that they, they do it to say yay or nay with science and said, seems like removing or not removing, watchful waiting and removing tonsils makes no difference. So remove it, not remove it. It's your standard of care for treating, but doesn't seem to make a difference. They're admitting in their own respected journal, New England doesn't get better than that. We do not believe that removing tonsils is going to do anything profound for treatment of ADHD and sleep apnea in children, but we're still doing it. The question is, why are we amputating a body organ that is doing its job? Why did we fail to ask the question of why they're inflamed in the first place? And why are we not going backwards to address that? We're just going to deliver symptoms. And the answer is, Chris, we're in such a fast world, fast-paced world. The one I was stuck in the first 10 years in a hamster wheel. We come out of school learning what, Chris? We learn, I'm going to speak for what I was trained. I don't know what they teach in chiropractic school. They teach me find cavities and fix them. Find periodontal disease, and this is how you treat it. You find malocclusion, you put orthodontics on it and treat it. This is what you do to patch. They, I did not learn how to create homeostasis. There is no dental coat that pays for restoring the mouth and finding the root cause of decay, which is not in the mouth. It's in the gut. Microbiome dysbiosis is all, it's the same tube. And in periodontal disease that's in the mouth is the same thing in the gut. How can we, how can we treat this and say it's all good when the gut still is in disruption? Because a dentist is not getting training on how to run blood work and gut mapping. The dentists are not learning the true pH of the mouth. It's like a conveyor belt from the mouth to the anus. It's literally one conveyor belt with different pH for getting the food, emulsifying it, breaking it down, go into the intestine, remove the bad pathogens, go into the absorption all the way through, through the colon. All of that has different pH. And if we are not cognizant of why the pH of the first line of introduction of food in our mouth is disrupted all the way down to the end of the tube. So the dentist is only given one window. So what did I learn the first 10 years? Which is why I told you dentistry didn't make sense. Just fix this part and fix, not ask a question how we can make him healthy. That is not a part of what we learned. Even when we were putting fluoride in the mouth, which is whole for another day, I don't like it. We are basically are trying to patch holes and fix things that happen in the mouth and any any chronic condition have some manifestation in the mouth only because I just got done explaining a half hour ago. Our mouth develops with us and it reflects us. And uh, I actually am starting my own podcast called Are You Highly Healthy or Highly Medicated? Your mouth will tell the truth. Because if your mouth could talk, everything that you suffer from, from your posture, from your malocclusion or maladapted posture, you know, your your asymmetry in your body, which result the organ functions, microbiome, pH, breathing. All of it is in the mouth, some form or another, from soft tissue to hard tissue to teeth. And this is they're not, the dentists, unfortunately, the front line runners of this field, we're not getting enough education. So they're teaching us to take out bicuspid extractions for, they're still doing that and putting silver fillings in the mouth. And until dental schools are fully embracing that dentists are the neurologists of the highest level. And this is, I think it was AC founder that said it, or somebody, he, he was a mentor of his. We are neurologists. Because teeth are formed from the same embryological tissue that endocrine system was formed from and our autonomic nervous system. That makes us exactly that center of everything that has to do with endocrine function and our autonomic function. And unfortunately, we're told just fix the teeth, give them straight teeth on a crooked skull. Yeah. So I'm that's a different term here. You know, functional neurologist really involves the dentist, like you're talking about, and mm -hmm. then the chiropractor, like I do with the structural correction work. Because, like, a regular neurologist looks at the brain, but we're looking at everything. So, like, even in chiropractic school, they teach you how to work on the neck and the back, but they're not showing you why the posture is off and how the every time they chew and swallow because the maxillary shape is off, why they keep breaking their neck uh, exactly. in the first place of, of how all that looks. And there's a million other things I could explain but you know they show you the skull they but they don't show you how the thing works you know and, and dental they, they show you the jaw but they don't tell you how the jaw works so we're you know we're up to our own to to learn this and if oh going through barbed wires i mean chris if you have patients listening to this they need to understand you are not are not the average chiropractor and dentist going out there in our silo doing what we were told because what i learned with the TMJ for the most part, we restore them in maximal inner conservation. And if they have a problem that they, you know, they're breaking their jaw joint and, you know, the TMJ patients are 
you know, far few in between, you send them to a spot. Well, we don't have specialists for TMJ. There's no specialty in dentistry. Same thing you guys were told about pelvis. I know I work with a lot of chiropractors that are focused on the most, called the low hanging fruit. They just adjust and duct tape that middle part of the spine, which is the most rewarding, just like we do with the occlusion. We just relieve them of the symptom until they collapse again. The thoracic spine, you just give them that relief. Ah, that was good. Call it a charity pop. <laughs> charity pop. Charity pop. Come back. I had conversations with chiropractors. They're like holding their adjustment. I'm like, I don't want duct taping. Yeah. Stabilize. Well, taping for me, like in, you know, when you look at the brain and upper cervical world, they'll talk about reflexes, like they're writing reflex, but it's not true. It's a, it's the brain trying to level the jaw so we can swallow a, a fixed yep. occlusion yep. all day. It has nothing to do with like the eyes. You know, when we talk about in our craniopathy yeah. course, where you yeah. know, I love chiropractic neurology. I've loved so learned so much from it, but they're still working with a crooked skull trying to develop all their pathways through the vein yeah. through the eyes or even osteopathy or cst is working with the door but the door is still torqued to a crooked skull this way or this way you know what i call the dora dora is that tissue like duct tape really what it is duct tape that holds us together so um basically we are we're trying to unglue the body where it has glued us because it was trying to avoid uh, something from happening as the proprioception led the body into that position. And then all we're doing by releasing it on a lot of techniques in dentistry is all focused on relaxing muscles and neuromuscular, you know, aspect of things and not understanding or addressing at the root cause why the orthopedic is ill fitted and a cricket skull. I call it scoliosis. It's a term. <laughs> <I know. laughs> like that. <laughs> like that. So I want to hold this very important bone. This is what, Chris, I believe brought you and me on this podcast right here. This one bone, this one you bone that basically is the other two feet that we're not walking on. We're bipedal animals. Not We're not animals. We're on four. We start on four. I got done explaining. We start walking and standing up when we get molars. So we go from quadruped to bipedal. And our airway adapts to it. We're not like dogs. Dogs don't have translation so if you're moving our arms there's two phases to it rotation translation same thing with our jaw and we open and translate so rotate translate there are two motions in this joint and it's not a weight-bearing joint we don't stand on i mean we're not against gravity directly with this joint like we are with our feet so when our jaw comes to close here and the temporomandible joint is is stuck in the socket i my skull kind of fall apart can you hold your skull for me here. Uh, yes there we go so look at the mandible right so our our skull when we stand up has to be supported on top of our cervical spine right that's ideal our head over the spine that's saying that goes they have a good set of they have a good head over their shoulders a head over the shoulder of the neck so the head needs to be supported like a teeter-totter what's in the very front to support it chris you you hold that up so it can just obvious right so when you're holding the head sideways please so the back of the head occiput where you have your hand <laughs> see that happened to me too i'm falling apart too but all right so it's entertaining but you're you the plane of occlusion right to so the map here Right. So the right. mandible yeah, right comes there. in. The mandible comes there in. And exactly. The mandible comes in and support that skull like the other two legs. Right. right? Our molars are supporting the our skull. Right. right. So go. back of the head sitting on the atlas. Mm -hmm. And then the front molars are the legs. And the other movable, adjustable leg in between is our temporomandible joint. So there's three attachments between our face and our skull. Teeth, jaw joint, spine over the atlas, occiput over the atlas, skull over the spine. So we had neck before we had teeth. So our neck is more important in determining where our head is positioned. When we walk, our teeth have no other place to come in but where the neck decided. So if you have that manual bro break on, which is that you know extension reflex has not integrated, we have no other option but to put our mouth to be supported in that position and now airway has to adapt to it right airway is being supported between our mouth and our neck and the airway gets twisted on one side or another what have you and then what do we do oh give them expand give them expanders okay what about the crookedness give them mandibular advancement and put our jaw over here i just hate the fact that we're dentists are still being taught to deal with the complexity and Newtonian, the quantum complexity of this from a Newtonian standpoint. It yeah. is, it's 
not getting enough attention. Well, even look um, at the shape of the bone, like this maxillary bone is a triangle on both sides of your face, right? In our last study group, they were talking, what you mentioned rapid expansion of this yep. palate is bad because you're they're already coming in with a pinched cribriform. Yep, right there. The so we're doing this. Yeah, and so you're making it even more pinched, so it keeps the immune system in that active state of not resolving its conflict. Yeah, this is what we learned just together uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Bob, he's a genius, and I'm just so grateful what they're what they're teaching dentists. For those who don't know who Bob Walker is, the original, you know, person who brought us together, me and Chris, with the chirodontics approach, which is very well geniusly placed, is how the mouth and 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 the neck is all related. And as he we, we know it, and he explained to us, the bones that are controlling the pressure in going in and out, it gets double impact affected by the palate expander. So we opening up one part of the nose to just get the air in, but we're shutting down the most important part of the nose, which is the filtration through the middle turbinates, very turbinates, where it's connected to this bone called ethmoid. Ethmoid is where the filtration and is connected to our sinuses back here. This is our maxillary sinus, connect to the maxillary sinus, which maxillary sinus is one of the most uh, packed areas, we get nitric oxide reduction, filtering the air, all the good benefits of nitric, nitric oxide we know is important for overall health and is produced from that. So we shut down the production of that, affecting our immune system, which means we get more, because a lot of people go through rapid expansion, Chris says, oh, I, I, can, I can breathe better. What's their measure? I can get the air in faster. Doesn't mean they're getting the right filtered air with the nitric oxide, with the immune system being stimulated for self, no self, like all the good stuff. So our immune system gets impacted, but we don't see it. I really like this analogy, and I think um, we're on top of the hour, so I want to be mindful of you know people who want to watch this. This is very important. I was always thinking I'm starting this um, this way of like introducing dentists to the world of airway the correct way, especially those who are doing dental orthopedics, trying to expand, I hate the word, to develop the oral environment. For tongue posture, which is important, for swallowing, which is important, more importantly, for the proper occlusion that's aligned with the rest of the body. So take this example. I hope that is going to bring everything that Chris and I talked about to, to full understanding and full grasp. Think of our bodies as a home. And for now, I'm not going to consider this as a mobile home, as a home that's sitting on an actual foundation. So the home uh, set on a foundation has a door. The door, the job of the door is to keep what's outside, outside, and what's inside, inside. What is the most important things that are we paying for to keep us in a homeostasis within the four walls of that home? Electricity or gas to keep the temperature at, let's say, 72. Why? At 72, we can be in our comfortable clothing, not have to wear a jacket. It could be in any room. We can freely move around. There's flow, right? So if the door doesn't function, there's going to be a leak around it, then the homeostasis inside is going to be disrupted because the temperature outside affects inside. And for the thermostat to keep that temperature regulated at the 72, let's say, that we want, has to work harder. So the main front door is going to tell the thermostat that you need to produce more heat. But then the bedroom doesn't have that problem. But the thermostat goes, let's crank this up. That's your hypothalamus pituitary adrenals, right? Crank it up. So now your heating bill goes up, your one room you're sleeping in is super hot, and still the main room is not. So you're not having homeostasis, you have to, you have to just be on, like you cannot wear comfortable clothes in that room in this room, so movement, you, you just don't want to be all over the house, the flow is disrupted. But more importantly, let's go back to the analogy of the door, because that's really where things are going to make sense from what we're talking about, the orthopedics, not the door. Think about the door itself as the mandible, right? The door has a hinge and the door has the lock. The lock in the door are teeth. So there's a part of the lock that's inside the door. There's a part of the lock inside the door frame. The part that's inside the door frame is your maxillary teeth. So if you think about the door lock, the locks come together like this, right? That's the dentist. That's that carpentry part. That's on dentist orthodontist. We only we only have training on the lock. We are the carpenters dealing with this. However, the door has a hinge. The hinge part that's sitting in that that's attached to the door is this, the condyles that's going inside the skull, and the door hinge that's attached to the door frame is the fossa. So now take a look at this. 
That door is attached to the door frame. It's sitting on a foundation. Now think about the foundation being uneven or shaky and, you know, sinkholes in Florida. The, the, the whole building is shaking. So the door frame and the door hinge is coming off because of foundation. So it affects this guy, this part of the door. So the door kind of comes cricket. And then pun is intended here. And then the what happens to the locks? The door is moving. So one side of the door moves, the other moves too. Pretty much what happens here. We don't get a chance. If your jaw moves, your teeth are going to be affected and the other way around. So the door lock, door, um, the, the locks come off. Who do you go to? You don't go to the basement guy, which is you and the physical therapist. You don't go to um, someone who fixed the hinge if you don't see it or the door frame is off or the cracks in the side. Who do we go to? We go to the carpenter and say, can you fix this? They come to the orthodontist and me. What do we do? We're like, oh, cool. Let's just go ahead and remove this part and let's go ahead and put them back together. As soon as you open the door, the hinges off and they come off again. That was relapse I was seeing in dentistry, right? The anterior open bite. Now think about, that's just the analogy of the physical aspect of things. But in the meantime, what's happening is as you open and close that door with no alignment between hinges and the building, you haven't addressed the building, by the way the door edges come off. If you're putting the locks where the hinge in the building is not, the edges of the door kind of start getting worn out, right? The hinge is going to go right faster. And now inside the house, the electricity bill goes high. Those are the fatigue patients. And 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 they they are they're 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 paying a huge bill on the electricity every month because they're trying to keep the homeostasis when nothing is working. But do you think the carpenter who caused that is going to come and say, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, the problem with your bill is because the door is not working? No. The same way that the dental community doesn't understand what we do can affect their neurological function, adaptive capacity, and their uh, the bills they're paying. Because what else can we do with the money we won't spend on the electric bill to keep this homeostasis of 72? Uh, I don't know, just paying for grocery, vital things. So what are the energy we're spending? Why do we have so much cortisol and hyperactivity or overactivity in our HPA, the cortisol, the adrenals? They're trying to work hard to make sense of a system that doesn't. And I'm just touching barely on the surface on one of the physiological aspects of things. So we, we now are, are, are paying all the bills to keep the house. Let me imagine we only have so much budget, right? The budget is going towards paying for bills that are just keeping us going. And we still don't have flow. We still have no homeostasis. And we're still dealing with a defective, noisy door. And three carpenters later, we reframe the door. We cut the door, got him a new door. The door doesn't fit the building. The building's still shaky, right? Oh, let's expand them, give them a bigger door. We have a bigger problem now. We cannot expand the maxilla to no end. So what I'm trying to really get with this example is it doesn't take a carpenter. It doesn't take someone to come and fix a thermostat. It's not the guy. In the, like it, it takes all of us. But unfortunately, the most obvious of things is either we go to someone to check the thermostat and it, it's not going to work. Trust me, it never goes. Or we're basically trying to get the door to work properly and we will never get there because it was never the door. The problem was never the locks, dentists, orthodontists. It was never the locks. It's what's holding this door together and the door cannot do the purpose of it because when our mandible and maxilla come to close, the system is closed, the tongue should go to the roof, like that pumping effect of that body. When, when there's a leak in the system, you can make it work by just working this one end of it. Because let me I think that's this. where you know, you'll see uh, a lot of parents make this decision for their kids. They've got some crooked teeth and then 80%, 80% of the time, dental orthopedic work fails because the body is going back to where it has to find its uh, best adaptive capacity because everything didn't get corrected. They just fixed part of the hinge, but not the you know the victim. Not, not even both ends of it for the most part. And and a lot of orthodontists do orthodontists without a TMJ aspect. And if you get open that box of TMJ, you have to see the body. Or if you deny it, we are. I mean, ninety percent of what's ninety percent plus. Of course, Bob Walker is not one. Of what is being taught is TMJ is focused on the teeth. And I keep going back and say, do you think we can like we could look at the hinge and say let's just align them with the door. But if the building still is the problem, the whole door frame is falling apart, the whole the whole system will come and fail faster now because the system will not let, the, there's, no, there's never going to be a balance between where the teeth and the hinge come together if the body that has governed the, the cervical spine was an issue and still is an issue. We haven't looked beyond that. And uh, the, the, like I said, a um, few things that really hit home for me is how they kept us dentists in the dark. And we go through the, and it's dentistry doing what we do is very lucrative. I mean, fixing and repairing is lucrative and annoying. 
And for me, 10 years of doing that, and I was blessed with the moment of sitting down and just questioning, does it still make sense? And it didn't, but it didn't have answers. So it's not for every dentist to say, well, I'm just going to get out of clinical dentistry, go back to all that four years of training, like my heart did, to get to where I am. No, but guess what? We're trying to pave that way. And we are hoping that we can get more of the dentists and chiropractors to see the viewpoints of what you and I are doing. And you have no idea, Chris, how many of the TMJ patients, TMJ, I'm using air quotes, come into me, they have a pelvic stability issue. I work closely with an amazing SOT chiropractor like yourself, Dr. Craig Pearson in Boulder. He's helped me a lot with a lot of these pelvic stabilities. And when they come to me, I do dental orthopedic with an aligned system and the TMJ problems go away. You know, there's more than one way to skin the cat, but we don't look at the system deep enough. And then some of us are, you know, having great mentors. You and I shared a lot of great common mentors. And we have conversations like this. We individually thinking that how can we bring this to the public and to our profession? And I'm hoping this, this webinar can do just that. I think um, there is a great need to talk about nutrition aspect, talk about why we have so much disrupted sleep. Let's look at it. Let's start talking about the mental, emotional aspect that's just not being talked about. It's a huge place in my heart because we have kids that are carrying a lot of uh, trauma with them from childhood, early childhood. And um, we're seeing more and more of it now. And uh, they're getting sedated by medications and cocktail of those SSRIs and ADHD medications and autism spectrum, which to this day, is this really autism? Because the spectrum is just a bunch of questioners. I don't know. How do they diagnose it? Do they have like a real validated biomarker? No, they're just asking questions. And if questions asked properly, um, are we able to go back and put the system into functioning and get the neurotoxins from their brain? Are they still autistic? And if they were not, did we fail to, to diagnose properly? And by the way, autism is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. I'm just putting it out there. I, I need to see a true autistic child. <laughs> Diabetes, same thing, you know, but... Uh... We could go on for hours. I think you preceded the next couple talks that we're going to have, obviously. And just so people know, this kind of work is from womb to tomb. So it's for everybody. I don't, Dr. Bahar, where is your uh, practice more pediatric or? Uh, all of it. All of it. All of it. Okay. I'm actually, even, um, I don't, I don't personally do a lot of tongue, uh, addressing tongue for infants, but I have worked with a lot of amazing doctors who do, and we could do a whole episode about tongue and the aspect of tongue release. Do we need to do a release? What else could be done for these children early on for adapting and turning off those reflexes, integrating the nerve and dial and, and wiring it back to the tongue. Awesome. Other than infants, I do treat children from three years and up for facial, uh, for facial development. My work is specifically just orthopedic development with light wire appliance, removable light wires. I don't do rapid expansions. I don't think it's doing any good for anyone. And I work with a lot of holistic physical therapists, chiropractors, nutritional, um, functional medicine are back in what I do in Boulder. And uh, we've kind of brought it down to an exact science and protocol. But unfortunately, uh, we can extend to so many radius, right? And I'm hoping that uh, we can have more doctors. And like in North Carolina, I have an amazing doctor who's going to be working with Dr. Chris. And I will encourage her patients to just, you know, like you guys are going to be amazing, amazing team. And having one chiropractor, dentist, PT, nutrition, look, all of it, your psychology, in every zip code so we can start decoding patients in their own terms because clinical randomized clinical trial has no bearing on a system when there's no shred of commonality other than symptoms between me and the population that tested. I tested. I'd be my best Christmas gift as an adult outside of getting a three-wheeler as a kid in second grade if I could find a dentist to do this work with, you know, because it's- Well, so guess what, old, you know, you've been, you've been good this so you're gonna get you, you mentioned your podcast earlier, where can people find you? Um, well, actually, now I have a website, airwayarchitect.com, and my, 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 my email that I have created for patients, for doctors, that I love, love, love to share my knowledge with, and I love helping patients. Um, I have a lot of doctors also that I can send them to if I can myself, airwayarc, airway, A-R-C, airwayarc at Gmail. That my email is probably the best and I'm starting to be more active my YouTube. So this video is going to show up on my YouTube as well. So I can share with people and I'm hoping that we can spread the word mostly to parents, to patients. I want them to know they are their own physician. Their body is this own physician. And all we are here to do is knowing where it's stuck, why it's compensating, remove the splinters so it can go back to what it can do best in flow and homeostasis. I love less medication, less procedure, less everything, and watching the bodies on one. And I have, 
um, seen it over and over. I don't know if you, you knew, I probably shared with you the, the, the case of no other but Mr. Shaquille O'Neal, prime example, amazing human, seven foot tall, non-responsive to CPAP, and so many episodes of heartburn, all of that. How did we get him to resolution and to where he is today? And within a year, just turning him to the side. I took a team, I can tell you that. But understanding that he was a stuck and unstuck and why, I mean, if every mad device in the world, every CPAP in the world fails, why are we still doing that? With the same patient asking for different results. Why would that? Because we, your brain, your eyes will look for what your brain knows. And I think what you and I here are trying to do is just awakening the brain of people who haven't seen it from this angle and see that their body's interconnected. If you're, if you're starting like my foot hurts one day and then I started like my shoe kind of bothering the top of my foot and the next week my jaw starts hurting and this side of my face is start hurting and my headache over there, start understanding that they're connected. That's your body kind of trying to readapt to something that doesn't work. You know, we put our feet on the ground, our mouth comes together, everything is just kind of stuck in between. So your body has to twist and untwist you like a pretzel so that you can avoid and exist and survive, survive, while there is something that is kind of messing with it, with the nervous system to be in homeostasis. And so you don't feel the pain and can breathe and walk and your head doesn't fall forward. Those are the things that body has to accomplish while there's a splinter somewhere. Well, let's get the freaking splinter out of there so they can go back to not doing this thing and breathe properly. It's very easy. Yep, smooth coupling, right? We don't want anything. No, we want them to go back to not be- The whole system of how exactly. you're doing it. Even a smooth coupling, we can give them something not to be, not to be smoothly. They're still spending some of their adaptive capacity. We can do better. You know, we're living in a world that is toxic in sensory deprivation chambers, modern homes with under these light bulbs that's killing our mitochondria. We have no access to the surface of the ground. Our electricity is short circuited. Our food is toxic. There's no nutrition. Our liver system is all like we are getting more toxic and our environment is just not allowing her to go into clearance mode. So we, th that's a part of just life, right? That's just a part of life. We are living in a world we cannot live outside. Unfortunately, our lives are just, we're, we're, we're stuck where we are. But how can we work within the parameters of that system and still put something back into the patients or people that come to us, I hear the call in patients, those people that come to us for help, how can we help them increase their adaptive capacity? That's the goal. That, and that's back, by the way, that guys, that's just so much fun doing what I do. I, I think you can tell it just comes out of every pore in my body because we co-discover people. Every patient is a puzzle. Every skull is a puzzle for me. And there's nothing I like more than human skulls and how they just untwist and unwind it with the rest of the team I work with. There we go, people. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for this information. And we were going to connect again on this. And uh, I will make sure everyone gets this uh, valuable information. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Excellent. Have a good day. Thanks. Yay. All right. Good job.